My guest in conversation today has appeared in Diction of Doc Green, It Ain't Half Hot Mom, Are You Be Served, Dad's Army, but it was landing the role of holiday camp comedian Spike Dixon in the massively successful series Heidi High that really put him on the map. And he followed this with, Oh, You Rang My Lord, and Oh, Dr. Beeching. He's appeared on stage throughout the UK and in the West End, and he's a regular at the Edinburgh Festival in his own one man show all about Stan Laurel. He is Geoffrey Holland, or Jeff to his friends. Hello. Oh, how lovely to say. What a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. I wondered if somebody else had come on. I mean, you, you said that. Hello. <laughs> there should be a round of applause after that, really, but it's just me and you. <laughs> well, I'll do it, shall I? There we go. Oh, well done. It's lovely to see. And here we are recording this uh, mid-July 2020 when things are a little bit crazy. How have you coped in lockdown? Because I know that you really like spending loads of time with your lovely uh, wife, Judy Buxton. So yeah. have you quite enjoyed it then, really? Well, it's been nice. It's been for like semi-retirement, really. But you're just, uh, you're just stuck at home and very little to worry about, very little to do. Going out maybe just twice a week to do a bit of shopping, have a little walk at the local shops. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it's, it suits me fine. I'm, I'm quite enjoying myself, really. No problems, touch wood. We're all fit and well, thank heavens. That's good news. Did you have any projects that were interrupted by this situation, Jeff? Yeah, I've got a few Mr. Laurel bookings, uh, which have had to be cancelled, you know, but um, it's a shame, but then we'll just have to rebook next year when, when everything's back to semblance of normality, shall we hope. Yeah, uh, just, just got to sit tight. I didn't realise that... Jeff Holland isn't your real name. You are, in fact, I've written it down here, Jeffrey Michael Parks, but that's uh, me as well. Yes. Well, when I joined Equity way back in 1967, uh, I couldn't use my name, Jeffrey Parks, because they, they said they got an, a member with the same name and they wouldn't allow it. So uh, I don't know who this other Jeffrey Parks is, but I picked Holland after a certain choice because it was my grandmother's maiden name. Oh, and I like the sound of it. So, uh, Jeffrey Holland must be fairly good to me. I can't complain, can I, really? <laughs> and you were born in, in Walsall, in, in the Midlands. And was it amateur drama that really got you going? It, it was, in effect. Yes, it, it was. Uh, my friend Peter and I, he's still my best friend to this day. Uh, we were known each other since we were four. And we were going to this rather boring youth club every Sunday evening. Uh, and he came to me one week when I was about 15. Uh, and he came and he said, listen, I found this amateur, amateur drama group. It's run by the co-op down in town and it's for under 21s. Uh, and he said, would you, would you want to come with me? I said, what do you mean, amateur drama group? What are you talking about? He said, well, they, they put plays on and do readings and stuff. I said, I said, what do you mean, act? Well, you know, you have to understand that 15, I was as tall as I am now, covered in spots, bottle end body holly glasses, you know, big teeth, no, no self-esteem whatsoever. The last thing I ever thought I would ever do in my life was stand up in front of people and act the goat. But no, he said, he said to me, um, well, the girls are very pretty. I said, what time do you want me? And that was the end of it, really. <laughs> I went down and, and, and found I got a, a, a gift for laughter and it all, it all sort of fell into place from there. Because 15 is, is quite late to discover that you actually like the theatre. Most people I've spoken to, they say, oh yeah, I remember when I was six and seven years old sitting in the theatre. But until 15, you'd never really thought about it. I've done a, a, a nativity play. I played Good King Wenceslas at the age of seven, I think, at school. With, with me wellies on and me dressing around on backwards, you know, with a little cardboard crown. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I thought then it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying, standing up in front of the rest of the class and pretending to be somebody else. But uh, no, it was, just, it was the laughter, you know. I, I went to this co-op drama group and I, um, I sat around in a big circle. We were reading uh, a play, it was 1066 and all that was the piece. Most amateur dramatic societies do it because it's such a big cast that there's, there's a part for everybody in it. Uh, and we were reading this and I got to this bit where I read this line and I heard laughter. And I read another line and I heard more laughter. And something went bing, and I thought, I'm having some of this. I like this, and it's sort of really the rest is history. You know? Yeah, you got very very serious about it, and you went to drama school. You decided to train in Birmingham. Is that right? In Birmingham, yes, in, in Edgbaston, the, the the big house that was the college I went to now is in, now in private hands. It's been resold and refurbished. And I think it's just been on the market for three and a half million quid. You know, but it was a grand old place when I was there in, in Edgbaston. And have you got happy memories of that? 
Oh, very, very. Three very happy years I spent there, yeah. yeah. And then you came out of there, Jeffrey. And was it, was it easy for you when you left stage school? Some people have really a tricky time and other people seem to get the break straight away. What about you? I got lucky. I did get lucky. I have hold my hands up and admit it. I got lucky. I'd been um, out of work and writing around all the reps because this was 1968 and there were still a lot of reps about then, repertory theatres. And I'd written all my letters, sent all my photographs off to these reps. And I'd been at home, um, twiddly bit times, for about six weeks after I'd finished college. And I got a phone call from um, a friend who wanted, uh, said that the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry, it was, which was being run by Roger Redfarn, uh, who'd been a student at the college where I'd been. And he rang the college and the college rang me because he was looking for about three, three lads of a certain age to be walking furniture in this huge production of, would you believe it, War and Peace, Tolstoy's War and Peace. You know, it was, a, it was quite a well-meant, but a rather ill-advised idea, I think. It was a production that it ran three and a half hours. I was going to say, it's a long one. <laughs> that was a cut version, you know, three and a half hours. And, uh, and I stayed on from there and played a small part in the next play. Uh, they seemed to like what I did and I played on, stayed on it. I then did another couple of plays. I ASM stage managed a, a few plays as well for them. And then I did my first pantomime that very same Christmas. This is from starting in the August. Uh, and nearly five years later, I'm still there. I learned my trade at that theatre. I learned, I did everything you could possibly do in the theatre. What you know, a wonderful opportunity. And of course, it, Birmingham and the Midlands, it was, it was a thriving theatrical scene then. Birmingham Rep, as you say, yes. uh, the Belgrade Theatre Coventry, it was, it was a good place to be. It was indeed. In fact, I got my equity card at the old Birmingham Rep while I was still a student at Birmingham. Uh, they were some boys and um, boys and girls in the show extras and I had to join equity then was it was then that I got my card and then when I left college a year or so later I went straight to Coventry and I stayed in Coventry because I met my first wife in Coventry she was a Coventry girl she joined the, the rep company uh, and we fell in love and got married and, and both my kids were born in Coventry uh, and as a result of that you know I, I didn't leave Coventry till well, 1976 and moved south you know to, to be near London for the business really but it was in, I think, 1975 that you first met two people who were to have such a massive impact on your career. I'm talking about the brilliant writers, David Croft and Jimmy Perry. How did that happen? Well, I was, it's funny then, I forget it was something to do with Roger Redfarm, because he was, he'd been uh, asked and booked to stage the stage version, the musical stage version of Dad's Army for Jimmy and, Jimmy and David. Jimmy and David ultimately oversaw the whole production, but Roger was asked to stage it, you know, because he was a, an experienced theatre director. And he rang my then agent and asked if he, I could come along to meet Jimmy and David because he thought I'd be very useful because they wanted lots of young boys and girls in the show at the time to, to play all the different characters and put different costumes on, play different background sets, virtually, uh, you know, walking furniture and pushing and pulling and doing all sorts. And what they called it, in fact, it was the ensemble, really, that I was a part of. There were like eight, six boys and six girls, I think, or maybe it was eight of each, I can't remember that. But we were all dressed in the, uh, appropriately, the, the reserved occupations costumes of the, of the wartime reserved occupations. You know, I, I was a fire, fireman. Uh, there, was a, there was a fireman, that was me, there was a, there was a policeman, there was a, a Bevan boy, there was a, a, a nurse, a bus conductress, uh, you know, you know, I've said police, but never mind, and various other you know, uh, boys and girls, uh, a land girl, very much so, and, uh, and we were all dressed up and, and understudy, uh, all the main TV principals, you know, and I got the, the uh, inevitable job of, of understudying Private Pike and Private Walker. And uh, that was, you know, an audition I went to that I wasn't really ready to go and do. I was working at Chichester at the time when, when the phone call came. And I had to leave halfway through the season because there was nothing for me in the third and fourth play of the season. I was in the first two, yeah. but the, the two actors I was sharing a house with there while we were digging in together, uh, they were staying on. And I was getting really 
Right. Right. Brass off, shall we say, that I had to leave and go and I was really enjoying myself with this. And I, I went up to London for that audition in the foulest of moods. I got nothing prepared at all. And um, I thought, well, if they want me to sing, I could sing, hang out the washing of the Siegfried line or anything from the water. Everybody will know that, you know. Uh, and uh, that's what happened. I, I got to the theatre, still in a foul mood, sat down, slumped, and, and uh, was given a script to look through before I was called in for the audition. Uh, and I found in the script uh, a parody of Yes, We Have No Bananas, which was a wartime song, obviously, and it was sung by Private Walker. So I thought, well, this is it, this is a gift. If they want me to sing, I can, I can sing this with the book in my hand. You know, a pianist about to know it, it's easy enough. And it was a parody. You know, Walker, he hadn't got any bananas, but he got a knicker elastic and, you know, he's got watches and they're all in the inside of his overcoat, you know. It was one of those, those were parody. And, uh, and that's what happened. I went in and I started to read. And I, I read a couple of scenes as Pike uh, with the company manager who was so bad, he made me look brilliant. <laughs> And then I, I was asked to read this mad German character, so I put on a funny German accent and funny German voice. And David and Jimmy were forward about laughing. They thought, well, I'm, I'm on a winner here. Then I, they got to this bit about, what about a song? And so I said, well, you know, I was, I was on a roll now. And I, I got the script out. I said, well, I found this in the script. You might have to do it with a book in my hand. So they said, well, it's all, go ahead. So I did. I sang, yes, we have no bananas with the book in my hand. Did all their words, all their parody words. And they were falling about laughing. And at the end of it, when it had finished, I said to them, you enjoyed that, didn't you? They said, yes, they said, yes, we did, actually. We did. I said, yes, but you wrote it. It was like, well, we've never heard it. No. We they need the performers to make it come alive. They wrote the words down and gave it to the typist and wrote it up and they put it in a drawer. They haven't seen it since. And uh, I got the job. I got the job and I had one of the most the happiest year of my theatrical life at that time ever. We Talk didn't... about destiny, eh? Oh, I don't know. Being in the right place at the right time. I was in the foul midst of moods, but I was there and I got it. But I did six months in, in, the, in the Shaftesbury Theatre in town with the, with the show. And, uh, and then we went on tour around the UK, uh, the, the spring of 76. And uh, then J Jimmy rang me up and asked me if I'd like to play Walker. Because John Barden, who'd gone into the show to play uh, Walker, James Beck was already dead by then. But uh, John Barden played it in, in, the, in London. He didn't want to do the tour because he had other stuff to do. So Jimmy asked me because I'd already learned it. I hadn't been on and played it. Uh, I'd learned the part and it would save a rehearsal. It would save a salary. Uh, and would I like to do it? Well, blimey, would I, eh? There's me standing on the stage on Nottingham Theatre Royal the first night of the the private walker with my gun at the ready with Captain Manning. Big Union Jack front cloth on, Union Jack flies out, and there's Mr. Mannering standing there, you know, with his platoon all around him, and me with the play walker with my rifle in bed, and tears rolling down my face. It was one of the brightest moments of my theatrical career. I mean, it was just wonderful, wonderful. So, Jeff, was, was Dad's Army the first successful thing that they wrote together? Because I know they wrote um, It Ate Our Hot Mom, and Are You Being Served, and obviously Hide Your Eye, and all this. But yeah. was Dad's Army their first success? It was, it was huge, because Jimmy Perry was fed up with being out of work as an actor. So he wrote this script with a view to writing himself a part. And he took it to David Croft, his agent. <laughs> Jimmy Perry's agent was in fact David Croft's wife. So there's the link. Right. Yeah. But they, they didn't really know each other, but uh, Jimmy knew about David, obviously through Anne, his wife, his agent. And he said, I've written this, and would you? he said, all right, I'll show it to David. And then, of course, David loves it, but there's a little bit of, you know, tweaking needs to be done here and there, and, and it was a, a huge success. But Jimmy wanted to play Walker. He wrote Walker for himself. But, of course, David, in his wisdom, uh, wouldn't let him play it. He wouldn't let him do it. He said, Jimmy, you can't be in the show and a writer, because you'll have all the others say, you'll give yourself the best lines, and, and all that kind of bitterness starts. And he, David would not allow Jimmy to, to play Walker. So they found James Beck, you know. But so that was the last was how it all started. But they, they, their, their success really was because they, they wrote about what they knew about. Yeah. You see, yeah. Jimmy had been the 15 year old home guard Pike himself right. in, in the Watford home guard uh, when he was 15. He was called up later and he went to Burma and he, he ran a concert party in Dulali in the Burmese jungle. 
And David was in the army and David served in Burma as well. They never met over there, but they both knew about the army and in Burma, they both knew about Burma. So they wrote a daft up mark. And then came, uh, along came Heidi Hive a few years later, uh, because Jimmy had been, again, been me. He'd been uh, the, the, the young comic. Oh, He'd been, uh, la his, his bill matter was Laugh and Be Merry with Jolly Jim Perry. That was Jimmy. <laughs> and he, he, he used to go to be a butler in Redcoat during his summer holidays when he was training as, uh, to be an actor at RADA. So he spent his summer holidays as a Redcoat. So he knew all about those characters. And David used to produce plays in Butler's camps as well at the time. And yes, because they had repertory companies, didn't they? The yes, camps then. Then. yes, back in the 50s. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, they both knew all about these people, these characters, and all the characters in Heidi High are based on people that they knew. You know, there was the, the, the television, the, not television, the, 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 um, the children's entertainer yes. who, hated, who hated kids. Yeah. The Punch of Duty man who couldn't stand kids. He couldn't bear them. But it was the only thing he could do in the summer, you know, was do this Punch of Duty act. There was the, the ballroom dancing couple who hadn't won a cup since 1943. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was the, the bent jockey who pulled the race and got, got to, you know, his license revoked. And he was looking after the donkeys and, the, and doing the donkey derby and all that stuff. All yeah. based on real people. No. Absolutely. Yeah. And I said that you had smaller parts or supporting roles in Are You Being Served and uh, and Dad's Army on, on telly and those things. So when Heidi High came along, well, they knew was, you. Was that was that an absolute offer to you? Pretty much so, because by the time I'd come out of the Dad's Army stage show in 76, the, over the next couple of three years, David asked me to do a couple of uh, Are You Being Served as a, a customer in Grace Brothers shop. Two different on the two different series, you know, very different characters. He'd also asked me to, to do a couple of episodes of Eight Half Hot Mom, uh, again, in two different series, um, one of which was quite dull, but the other one, I'm pretty sure, I'm convinced to this day, was my unofficial audition for Heidi High, because it was a wonderful character. And it was about this gormless RAF twit who turns up looking really gormless and stupid, but he can do everything that the boys can, but better, on his own. You know, I don't help from a lot of friends. I must admit, I was doing a lot of miming for that. Because he could sing opera, he could play classical piano. You know, there was a pianist off, off camera with playing Greek's piano concerto, and there's me miming to it, you know. And then we did a, a, a trumpet uh, act, where playing the flight of the bumblebee on a trumpet. And that was the wonderful Kenny Baker who recorded that for me to mime to. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the ventriloquist act as well, which I pre-recorded the voice for, so I didn't have to lip sync. And it all, it all, it all came together in a 10 minute splash, of, of a gift for me. And it brought the house down in the studio. And uh, then when Heidi High came up, I'd done all that for them by then. And when Heidi they High... Knew. They knew. They got you in their mind. Well, they wrote Sp Spike with me in mind, you see, which was wonderful. And so, when the series was first talked about, Jeff, did they know how many episodes they got? Was it a dead cert or did you have to do a pilot first? What happened? Well, we did, oh, David always did a pilot for okay. everything he made. He did a pilot first, submitted the pilot, and then we picked up the following year with maybe five or six episodes to make the first series complete. We always started with a pilot and we did So you that. had to wait a year from the pilot to the first episode? Yeah, yeah, I know. It was a nightmare, but that's the way it's, the BBC worked it that way in that, at that time. Yeah, so, so were we, you turning work down thinking, no, I've got to, I've got to stay free because this oh, series I, come along? I think we knew fairly soon because the pilot um, was made in, in 79, October 79. Yeah. Uh, and it was transmitted in uh, New Year's Day 1980. It didn't, it didn't come out. Till and we made the first series the following autumn. Right. And it, it, got, it was such a hit. You know, it was obviously recommissioned straight away and recommissioned. For and was it all the same cast? The people who did the pilots went on to do the series? There were no cast changes? There was one cast change, one major one, and that was Simon Cadell, who played Jeffrey Fairbrother, the entertainment manager, was the fish out of water, was a Cambridge professor. Yes. Uh, and he just got so fed up of his job being so boring that he wanted some excitement. And he came to this hominy camp because Joe Maplin, obviously, in the theory, in the story, thought he would end, end, lend a bit of class to the place. 
you know, but Simon, after four years, four series, Simon, uh, you know, felt he'd had enough and he wanted to move on and do other stuff. All right. So yeah. he left. He left the show. Yes. And then Jimmy and David were left with a, with a quandary because they didn't know whether to to recast another character in a very similar character, or whether to turn it on its head and have somebody completely different on the other way about. So that's what that's the decision they made, and they 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 cast David Griffin to play squadron leader Clive Dempster, DFC. He was an absolute cad and a rotter. Yeah. You know, and he wore this wonderful tweed cap, very suave, XRF wing commander and, uh, and uh, squadron leader, rather. And uh, he, he turned Gladys Pugh, Wolf Maddox's character, completely on its head because uh, you know, during the first series of Simon Cadell, she was doing all the flirting and yes. all the coming on to him. Yeah. And he was, he was embarrassingly backing off. And, uh, you know. uh, but with the other way round, it was David Griffith's character, uh, Clive, who did all the flirting. And, and Gladys had to do all the backing off. At the end of the series, they wrapped it all up with them getting married anyway. So, but, but it was for the start, it was all the other way around. But the show survived that. The show survived the changes. And it went on, you know, to be a huge success for about, about nine years. Oh, I mean, just how exciting to do that pilot. You meet all those people. Did you know anybody? Did you know Sue Pollard or? Um, no, I didn't know Sue. To, to be honest with you, I'll tell this to everybody. She frightened the life out of me. She frightened me to death. I thought, well, Sue Pollard did. This, this. You know, she turned up on the first day of rehearsals wearing a, a man's dark brown overcoat, which nearly reached the floor, and a bowler hat, which was too big for her. And that wonderful character, that personality, that voice, you know, and I thought, oh my God. What the hell's how's this going to work out? But of course he did, and she's one of my best friends to this day now. Oh, how wonderful! So, and, you know, where did they know Sue Pollard from? Um, well, had she worked for them before or not? No, she was with uh, an agent called Richard Stone, okay. who at the time looked after Jimmy and David, wow. and uh, they wanted a, an eccentric North Country girl to play the chalet maid. And Richard said, "Well, I've got somebody you ought to see." And then you know, she went to see Jimmy and David at Jimmy's flat in Westminster, you know, and, uh, and that was it. She never stopped talking and they, you know, they, they, they snapped her up. They couldn't believe their luck. It was it's such, I mean, what was great about that series, and I'm sure you felt this working on it, was that you were with very experienced people. I mean, there was Ruth Maddock, who, I don't know if people realise, but she had this amazing singing career. She's in the original uh, Fiddler on the Roof film. She plays Spoon Masara with this, all this, Operatic stuff. She's got that great voice. Sue Pollard, great voice. Uh, you've got Paul Shane, who was a seasoned comedian, and then you with all that experience. So it was a great coming together of experienced people. Yeah, experienced people, really theatrically experienced people, myself included. You know, and which is why the stage show worked. When we in the mid eighties, we did a stage show. We did a summer season of Born of a Million. And then we went to the Victoria Palace for the Christmas season that year. And none of us did Panto. We did Heidi High instead on stage twice nightly. Oh. And then we went to Blackpool the following summer in 84 to the Opera House in Blackpool. And did, did the summer season of 12 weeks there twice nightly. And of course, that's why, that's why the show works so well, because we were all theatrically experienced people. A lot of people who do telly sitcom haven't done much theatre. But we, we all had, you know, Paul Louis stuff, we got a wonderful voice, singing voice as well, anyways. Yeah, so it yeah. all worked out with Ruth being a singer, Sue being a, a great natural singer, you know, and I did my best, but you know, I'm not really a singer. I could hold a tune, but um, you know, we, we all had a wonderful time. I, I loved it because of course, I've, I'm, I'm one of those kids who, who who went to Butlins and absolutely loved it with all the with all the red coats, you know, yeah. I absolutely loved it. Uh, when it, where was it filmed by? I mean, everybody must ask you this, but where was it filmed? It was filmed, the, the location stuff was filmed at a holiday camp, which was one of Warner's holiday camps, and it was in a place called Dovercourt, which is just outside Harwich, in Essex. Right. But the sea is brown, in fact. <laughs> but it's, it, was a, it was a wonderful old camp, it was very old, it was pre-war. Yeah, uh, and we used to go in with the bunting and all the all the coloured stuff and, and dress it up, make it look good. I mean, it looked like an old prison. In fact, I say that, but it had been uh, an Italian prison of war internment camp during. Really. <coughs> and and how did you how did you do the episodes? Did you do all the exterior scenes for all the episodes? in one particular block and then you'd go into the studio or did you That's right. we did, we did exactly that we spent three weeks at the holiday camp and all surrounding areas if we went out into the streets or something right. we did all the exterior show, show from all the all these six or seven episodes however many we were doing and then we used to go back and in, 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 in the space of a week 
we'd record the show in front of a studio audience in the, in the BBC uh, on Friday night. Yeah. And uh, we'd play in all the filmed stuff that we'd got for that particular episode that we'd already um, recorded. We played it in for, into the audience so that they could laugh and enjoy it, you know, as the continuity of the piece as it went through. And we did that each week for, you know, however so many, many weeks we, we were there. Was it an instant success with the television audience, Jack? It was incredible because we, we, when we did the pilot, remember we had a year to wait before we knew whether we were going to, you know, we, we just had a feeling that there was something about this. It was, it was the colour of it, the characters, the colour, uh, the warmth. And we, we thought, I think, fingers crossed, we're going to win it here. Fingers crossed, we were all, you know, that way. But uh, it was incredible because I remember when the third episode had aired, I lived in uh, Hertfordshire at the time, and my, my first, then wife and I were shopping in, in Watford, just literally walking down the street. I've always worn glasses, um, and, you know, like you, and I've always had, at the time I was wearing what I called my John Majors. You know, they were quite enormous bottle end lenses, and, and I was walking down the street, sort of not very recognisable, if you like, because I, I never worked with them on. I used to wear barefaced and just yeah. grow around, fight my way around. Yeah. But... Um, and there, so Spike wasn't an issue as far as being recognised. And then suddenly I was in the high street in Watford and I heard this lad across the uh, street yell, Heidi, hi! And I thought, oh my God, I've been recognised. <gasps> and it was the first time and I didn't know, I couldn't cope. I didn't know what to do, whether to wave to him or, or look at him. Or Eventually I did, you know, it must have been seconds, but it seemed like half an hour but I was making this decision. I looked around and I saw him across the street but he wasn't shouting it to me. He was shouting Heidi Hi to his mate, who was across the street further up the road. Really? That's how quickly it had taken off, you know, using the use of the phrase. Oh. Yeah. So to my great relief, we carried on shopping and nothing was amiss. <laughs> <laughs> because you see, that's what nobody prepares you for. No. That fame thing, being recognized, that's a whole different deal, isn't it? It is, it is, yeah. You must have had the same thing with Boo Peter, though, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, whatever you do, you, you and, and then suddenly you, it goes quiet, and then you do something on telly and everybody sees you again, and you've kind of got used to, to being under the radar and suddenly yeah. you're on there again, but, you know, experience counts in, in that situation. Right. Well, you know, we were very lucky because when Heidi High came to an end, um, you know, it was during the penultimate series, actually, in 1986, because we did the last series in 87. But during the penultimate series, while we were rehearsing one day, Jimmy and David uh, took Paul Shade and Sue Pollard and me aside and said, could you three stay on when we wrap the rehearsal up today? We, you know, we, we'd like to have a word with you. And we all thought, oh my God, what have we done? We got the sack. What's happened, you know? Anyway, we stayed behind and they sat us down and uh, they, they announced then to us that the following year, the next series that we were going to do the following year would be the last series of Heidi High. We all went, oh, oh dear, oh. what a shame, you know, but all good things and all that. But yeah. then they, in the next breath, announced that they got a, a plans for another pilot of a new idea uh, of, a, of a, um, a, an upstairs downstairs spoof, if you like, yeah. which is exactly what it turned out to be at the beginning. Uh, it felt its own way, it made its own way eventually. But this, was, of course, it, is You Rang My Lord. You Rang My Lord, is, yes, You Rang My Lord. And um, the original concept was that, you know, I should play the, the, the footman, uh, subservient to the butler, who'd be played by Paul, uh, and then Sue would play the uh, chambermaid, right. Ivy, who turned out to be Paul's daughter in the show. And but nobody's to know, you see, that's one of the little secrets, nobody's to know. Yes. And, uh, but, and it starts off, the, the pilot it starts off with us in the trenches in the First World War on, on a real battlefield. They, they, they mocked up this battlefield that you to die for you. It would have been any, any you know, epic film would have been proud of that battlefield. It was incredible. Um, but the thing about the original concept was to set it during the abdication years in the 30s. But, but then, Jeff, can I just stop you? When, when, when you were told, when the three of you were told, okay, it's coming to an end, you're carrying on. Were you told, but please don't say anything to anybody else? We were actually asked, yes, if we would keep it to ourselves. Um, That's we, difficult we, because by we, then you've, you've become great mates with your yeah. Heidi High family. Yes, we, 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 we did. Um, we knew uh, by the, when we were making the final series, it was officially announced. 
that okay. we were involved in a pilot. And then we, you know, we didn't tell them, it was, they were told. And of course, all the girls, were, uh, uh, we, oh. we had a, a final party at the end of Heidi High. You know, we were, they all said, sort of, well, enjoy the pilot then. <laughs> There's a lot of that going on, you know. But they, they were only joking. They, they, they were quite pleased for us, really. But uh, it was it was, it was lovely. Paul, Sue, and I to go on to do something else. Oh. But Mary, I was going to say, it was set during the 30s, the abdication years. Yes. But Mary Husband, who designed the costumes, said, no, don't set it in the 30s. Set it in the 20s. Because the costumes for the ladies could be so much more yeah. vibrant and, you know, exciting yeah. and colourful. Yeah. Of course, they were. She had a ball designing that show, yeah. real ball. So, you know, so much of the success of these programs is the look. And you mentioned Heidi High in the nineteen fifties thing. Yes. And of course, the music and the and the skirts and the guys with the with the quay from the suits. It, it that's very important, isn't it? It is the style of it all. Of course, I mean, the Orangalons were in the twenties. The costumes were amazing, and the, the house set. You know, it was like working in a real house. You know, and the, and the costumes on there, I had a stiff collar and I had to stand up straight all day. At the end of recording on a Friday night, my back was killing me, you know, I was just standing up rigid all day long. But it was well worth it because it was such fun. And yeah. how long did that last? You ran my life? That ran for four years because each, each programme was 50 minutes long. They, they sort of doubled the output, really. We did 26 episodes over four years uh, and they were all 50 minutes long. And... Uh, that's sort of they've written it out after the fourth year. In fact, things were going pretty bad at the BBC at the time, okay. and uh, they ne we, they nearly didn't get the fourth series uh, commissioned, but they did eventually. They had a chat with John Burt, and I think he saw the error of his ways, and we were allowed to make a fourth and final series. And then, how long between you rung my lord and old Doctor Beeching? Well, about three or four years went by because we we again we made a pilot of Doctor Beeching um, in in the summer of. It was 95. So we, uh, you, you ran came to an end in 92. Yeah. And uh, then it was not until 95 that Richard Spenlove, who was a broadcaster himself, a great fan of Jimmy and David's work, he had been a, one of the youngest station masters in the country in, in his young in his long life. When he was 23 years old, he was a station master on a country or railway station. And he had the idea of, of getting Jimmy and David to write a comedy series based on, in the beaching years, the early 60s, when those, you know, Beachy was out there with his axe, chopping everything up. And, uh, and, but he took it to David and Jimmy, and David loved it. But unfortunately, Jimmy didn't really want to have anything to do with it, because Jimmy's, it, by tradition, you see, Jimmy had only ever written about what he knew about. Yes. And he didn't know anything about the railways. In fact, he didn't even like the idea of steam railways at all. Uh, so he backed off. And then uh, David uh, asked Richard to join him as co-writer officially. It's written by David Croft and Richard Spenlove, although Richard didn't actually have much to do with the creative writing process. There were uh, several guest writers brought in, to, uh, uh, sort of a uh, sort of team uh, made of it, you know. Right. So that's what uh, that's what they did. With with David Croft and Jimmy Perry, um, could you change lines? Were you allowed to have some input at all as actors? No. No, absolutely not. No, because the scripts were honed and toned. With their experience, you know, you got your working script and everything was right. Uh, Jimmy would get very upset if you um, if you changed a, a, a butt to an and or something. You know, he said, "Don't, don't do that, dear boy. Don't do that." Because you see, it looks like bad writing, and it reflected on him. You see, and it was absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. And All Dave, the great writers say the same thing. Alan Akebourne says that. Ray Cooney, of course, well, I know you've worked yeah, for. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's all been very carefully worked out. It's a piece of music, isn't it? Really? It is indeed. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. It's fine-tuned. Yeah. But uh, actors tried it on. In fact, I've only ever known the one, one gag that uh, Paul Shane suggested that Felix Boness spoke the line um, about his, his old horses. You know, he said they, they, they're so old. He said they're knackered. They're so old, they have to tiptoe past the glue factory. You know, <laughs> and that was one of well, Paul Shade's ideas. He said that to David. David fell on the floor laughing. He thought it was wonderful. So he, he allowed him to put that in. And it was for Felix, not for himself. You know, Felix said, spoke the line. But Melvin Hayes tells a, a lovely story about that. Uh, you know, David, how about this, David? He said, the so, 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 diddly, diddly, do, diddly, do, did him. And David goes, ha, 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 ha,
Save it for Panto, Luffy, say. Save it for Panto. <laughs> Marvellous. Talking of which, talking about Panto, I'm noticing, of course, the posters behind you. You've done so many. And is, is it true that, because you're a, you're a famous Dane, you have been one of Britain's top five Danes. And well, is it true that you actually stood in for Frankie Howard? He was, he was playing Dame and you stood in it. Have, have I got that right? Sort of. Yes, you've got it half right, because I, I, was, I was playing the comic yeah. uh, in the show. Uh, and he was playing, uh, I was, no, no, I was, I was playing a supporting role in the show. Back in 79, this is, long before Heidi Hyatt, before I was known. Yeah. I was working in a pantomime at Birmingham and Alexandra Theatre. Uh, it was uh, Robinson Crusoe and Frankie Howard was playing Billy Crusoe. Oh, he's playing uh, Billy Crusoe, okay. And he also did a drag scene in the show with Bernie Breslau. Big Bernie Breslau was playing Cap uh, Captain Kidd the Pirate, you know, as a villain. Wonderful. <laughs> Because Bernie was six foot seven in real life and he had high heel boots and a big pirate's hat. He was barely eight feet tall on the stage. Marvellous, marvellous. And, um, and then Frankie, sadly, in, was about three weeks in to the run, um, fractured his hip. He fell over in this in the first fall of snow we had, you know, on an icy floor. He's gone down the corner shop to get a jar of coffee and he fell over and fractured his hip. So he had to go to the hospital and come out of the show. And of course, I was the understudy. I was covering for him. They, they, uh, they. To cut a long story short, I went on and played Billy Crusoe, and I did this drag scene because Bernie, you know, Jack Tripp was playing the Dame in the show. And Jack okay. was a very experienced Dame, wonderful Dame. Yeah, yeah. They took took objection to this of me doing this drag scene as an inexperienced um, uh, actor, which I was at the time, you know, as far as he was concerned, to do a drag scene when he was a professional uh, drag artist and. Uh, but Bernie insisted that the scene stay in because he was getting all the laughs in it. He was enjoying it. So I got to, got to get away with it, doing this drag scene. And eventually they led on to me a few years later uh, playing Dave. And when it happened to me, I was about three, 1989 exactly. And I'd been, I'd been booked to play Muddles, the comic, yeah. in, in, a, in a new production of The Sleeping Beauty, which was being done at the Theatre Royal Plymouth directed by Roger Redfall, again. And uh, I've been doing Run For Your Wife in, in town, on and off, for about three or four years for Paul Elliott. And at the end of one particular session, in the spring of 89, I was leaving, we had an end of term party at Paul's house. And when I was leaving, he saw me off the premises. And I turned around and said, oh, by the way, who's playing Dame with us at Plymouth this year? Because the, sh the stars of the show were Hinge and Brackett. Oh, that wonderful, you. wonderful double yeah, on yeah. Act, Hinge and Brackett, who were fabulous comics. And uh, well, Paul said, I can't get anyone to do it because he'd already booked me to play models. I can't get anyone to do it. I said, Why? He said, Well, everybody I've asked uh, said it'll be like having three dames on the stage with those two. I said, Well, that's absolute rubbish because to me, Hinge and Brackett, I was a huge fan of Hinge and Brackett, and those characters were totally 100% feminine. Yes. And, you know, not, were, and not dame characters at all. No, not at all. They were genteel old ladies. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the dame is a very much a different slapstick bloke in a frock, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, I heard myself say those three fateful words. I'll do it. <laughs> and he looked at me. Not, not those famous two words, how much, just I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. Because I was ready. I was 43 then, and I was ready. You know, I felt I was ready. Oh, I think I'd always end up playing Dame at some point, but uh, I was well, well and truly ready by then. Well, I've seen you play Dame and, it's, and it's, it's terrific. And of course, you're a good actor. So you play those scenes because people forget that pantomime, the stories are wonderful stories. Oh, the kids yeah. that they're taking in. And yeah. I've seen you on stage and you play those scenes when Widow Twanky or whatever it might be, you know, is really upset and you play that for real and that's why it works. Jeff, oh. I want to talk to you about when, when we worked together, when we did... Um, uh, talent, talent, Victoria Wood, uh, yes. the many a chocolate factory in London. Yes. Um, God bless. It, she's, it was she's scary. No with us. scary. It, was scary. scary. it was scary because Victoria, having written it, was directing it, and you try and paraphrase in front of that lady. I, I, I did. I'm a terrible paraphraser, and I did once. I got. She said, "Could you get that phrase right, please?" Because I wrote that specially, and you know, it's 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 not right the way you're doing it. Sorry, sorry. So yes, I did. I worked very hard to get every word right in that play for her. Well, that's what I was going to say to you. You know, what, what are your experiences of, of, of working with her? How did you feel about it? I know how I feel about it, but how do you feel about it? 
Well, I did. I, mean, I loved it. I mean, got the most enormous respect for that woman, and she she was she was fantastic talent. Literally, mm. name the name of the play, and uh, and it was an absolute joy to be part of that because I played a, 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 an old character as well as we you, us three doing doing the triple velvets, the the, the, the rock group, the pop group. Oh, that was funny. That was really, wasn't it? Those platforms. Yeah, we have to open the show for those people who don't know what we're talking about because in the original talent that's been seen on television, these characters aren't there, but Victoria came up with this wonderful idea that the opening scene should be on stage in this nightclub in Manchester. And that's this right. band come on called the Triple Velvets, and there we all were in our bright blue suede blue, suit suit and flared trousers and platform shoes this high. And we had to dance to them, didn't we? I know, and those microphones with a long wire that kept the getting out of our feet. And... Oh, God, how we got through that show, I'll never know, but we did. We do we had a ball artistic. But, but but Victoria was as as you say, she 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 want she was a perfectionist, absolute perfectionist, and she wanted it to be as as, as right as possible. And that sometimes that was that was tricky because you had to be on it totally, didn't you? Really? Yeah, she did. But she was very, very modest and very shy as well. Yeah. And I remember when we wrapped it up the, on, the, on the last night at, at the chocolate factory, many a chocolate factory. Uh, she was going to come on stage and, and take the curtain call with us. And she, it was down to me, I got the job of introducing her before yeah. we'd taken our bow and then we brought her on. And she, she took me aside before and she said, please, please, please don't refer to me as a national treasure because I'm not. <laughs> but that's how she thought, you know, she was, she was a national treasure. Yeah. But she didn't want to be thought that way, so we didn't. I just, I think I said something like, ladies and gentlemen, we couldn't have done it without her. Would you please welcome Miss Victoria? Well, I think that's honestly, something like that. But she came on stage, took a bow, and then we all went off, quick, we're going to take three with her, but she just did one, and that was it, we're, we're gone. I think what was amazing was that this, this was a play that was first done back in the 70s, when it was her and Julie Walters. Yes. So she could have quite easily just taken the play and said, okay, there's the play, do it, I'll direct it, but she, she kept on adding things and changing things and bringing it, just bringing a, a new look to it. She made it evolve into what it became. Yeah. yeah. And the perfect space for it, yeah. Oh. A sad, sad loss. You know, I was absolutely devastated when she went. But like you, I just feel so privileged to have worked with her. So let's just very quickly before we, because our time's almost up on this, um, right. let's talk about the one man show, which I saw at the Edinburgh Festival a couple of years ago. Absolutely wonderful, what's it called? And this is my friend, Mr. Lowell, all about Stan Lowell. How did that come your way? Well, it was an idea I had from way back in the 1970s when the BBC started to show Laurel and Hardy on BBC Two at six o'clock in the evening. Um, they'd been a, a part of my life since I was a small boy. I'd been watching them at the Saturday morning picture shows. And when that uh, BBC started to show them again, my love for them get rekindled. Uh, because, you know, you move on, you grow up, your priorities change, and I, that's what I'd done. And I was a, a very young actor at the time in Coventry, um, pursuing my career. And I thought, what a wonderful idea it would be. Because uh, I'd loved Laurel and Hardy, I knew all about them, and I knew the storyline behind it. Stan's life. It was a fascinating tale to tell, and so many things that people don't know about him. Uh, that I thought it would be great to do a, a show. But I knew I, I was too young, I was only in my 20s then. And I cut you, know, you can't do a one man show about somebody like him who's long dead, you know, um, when you're that young, because you can't tell, well, to put it simply, you can't tell a life story until you've had a life. Mm. So I knew I'd have to wait. And wait, I did. And I waited over 40 years to get that show together. And then what, of course, Judy kept saying, my wife Judy, she kept saying to me, when are you going to get this Stan Laurel show together? I said, listen, it'll happen. It'll happen when it's made. She said, you keep talking about it. You've talked about this since I've known you, she said. But it, it, why don't you get off your backside and do something about it? I said, well, listen, it, it'll all fall into place when it's meant to. I've always believed that. Yeah. And it did. It did. We went to see a friend of ours in a charity show. Um, doing good work and raising money for the right reasons. And, and in the audience, along with us, was another actress that we knew who'd come along to support this same friend. And like you do in the interval over a drink, you say, what are you up to at the moment? Of course, this, this girl was doing uh, a one-woman play written by a wonderful writer called Gail Lowe. Uh, and uh, she said, it's a fabulous piece. She said, what I love about it is the writing. The writing is sensational. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, because I'm looking for a writer 
uh, to help me write a, a one-man show about Stan Laurel of Laurel and Hardy. Because I'd, I'd found somebody, but got together with somebody, but we, we just didn't see eye to eye over things, so we shook hands and walked away. And I was still out there looking for someone, and uh, this happened, and she said, well, she was doing this play at Guildford in the studio theatre, uh, and uh, she said, come on and see it next week, and as it happened, we could. We went on to see the play, and I was introduced to, to Gail Lowe after the show, because she was there that night, and uh, she said, oh, you're the man who wants to do the one-man show about Stan Laurel, are you? And she said, oh, she, I said, she, she told you, did she? And she says, yes, she did. She says, when do we start? Wow. So, you know, that was that. And we did, we collaborated on it. And Gail was a wonderful writer. Well, you've seen the play. Yes. You know, there's kind of dialogue in there. It's quite poignant, a lot of it. But what I love about Gail's writing is that she writes the way people speak. So you know how sometimes you start a sentence you don't quite finish it, then you go back and you start it again and then you finish it with something you wouldn't have said in the first place. <laughs> There's an awful lot of that in this play, which I love. And of course, I, was, I had a wonderful job of being able to put all the comedy in. So yeah. I chose my Laurel and Hardy clips from the films, a bit of dialogue from the films or the movies, because at various points, it's just a, a visit to a sick man. Um, it, he pays a call to Oliver Hardy's um, sick room, his bedroom, his, like, you know, all there is on the stage uh, is the bed frame made of white tubing and a little white chair and me with my bowler hat and my bow tie and my, and my suit and I just arrive and chat to an imaginary Oliver Hardy who's lying in bed he can't move he can't speak he's had a massive stroke which eventually he died off I said uh, and that's the way that the uh, it was Gail's idea to, to use that device to tell the story it's a brilliant you, idea anywhere in time and bring a memory forward and then at various points in the play the lights change the, the general lighting disappears and the spotlight comes on me and I put the hat on. Yeah. And then I do Laurel and Hardy. Yeah. So you've got a bit of dialogue from, from the, 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 the films and that, that gets some wonderful laughs. Uh, and that, 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 that brings the changes. It takes you to a different place. And then you yeah. have a good laugh at that. Then you come back to the bedroom and tell a bit more of the story. It's a, it's a one hour, one, one act piece. It's superb. Yeah. How scary is it to be up there on your own, Jack? Well, I'm not on my own. I've got Oliver Hardy on there. <laughs> He's there all the time. Oh, that's a lovely answer. It, it, it was very, uh, very lovely. Somebody said to me, well, you know, I could, I could see him there. He was lying there. Yeah. He, he was listening to every word you said. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I, I felt that when I saw it, absolutely. Oh, thank you. But still, but it's you up there, you know, and we've all been on stage. I mean, I've, the closest I've come is when I did Woman in Black, and that's really a two-hander. Yes. And that was scary enough, but at least there was somebody else. If, if either of us just sort of lost a line or whatever, we could help each other, but I you're to, on there. I have, my, I have to give myself cues all the way through it, mental cues, you know, verbal cues. Uh, and I'm, uh, I've done over, I think the last performance I did was just before lockdown, uh, and it was performance number 211, I think. And when I went to do it the first time, I did it at the Camden Festival at the Gatehouse Theatre in Highgate. And when I got to performance number four, literally, and during that first week, uh, I dried stone dead. Completely dried stone dead. I, didn't, I couldn't imagine what came next. You know, I usually give myself a little gesture, which yeah. takes me into the next section, because they're all non secretaries these sections. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, a word or, 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 or movement or a thought. Uh, but I, I just, I, I indulged myself in a laugh I got from the audience. I thought, well, oh, that was nice. That was a nice laugh. Better than the laugh I got this time last night. And then... And it brought you back, did it? What the hell have I got? What do I say now? I'm gone. Oh. Because I hadn't done a gesture that I finished the previous section with. And, you know, it was, a, it, it was, a, it was tantamount to a golf, a golf swing, if you like. Yes. It takes me into the next line, which is, you're going to play golf again. To, to Oliver Hardy, you see. Yeah. And that's, that's the link to the next bit. It went completely. I had to ask for a line from the stage manager who was in a gallery above me. Fortunately, he gave me the line, and I'm a bit deaf, but I did hear it, fortunately, and I carried on. And, well, it was amazing because I went to see, I got some friends in that day as well, and, and you know, posted on prose, and uh, went had a drink in the bar afterwards. I apologized. I said, I'm so sorry about that dry. They said, What dry? Really? Uh, and then I explained what I'd done because I did it with, you know, I did it with conviction. I said, I'm, I'm hand on my heart. You know, I shouted in a very loud voice, Nick, give me a line, will you? 
you know, to Nick, and Nick heard me, gave me the line. I said, thank you, and I carried on. I was so mad with myself. But then I apologised to the president. I said, oh, that, we thought that was part of the show. Yeah. Well, I can imagine, and this happens time and time again. You're on stage, you feel it's the, wor the yeah. worst thing. It's three or four seconds, but it seems a lifetime, but they don't even notice. They didn't. Oh. Because I did it, I, did, I followed my training. I've always taught, if you're going to do something on stage, do it with conviction. Yeah. So I asked for that line with conviction in a very loud voice. I thought, well, there's no, there's no wriggling out of this. I've tried. They yeah. were, there's something wrong. I muttered to the... those words, keep calm and carry on. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> That's our mantra. That's our mantra in this in this business. It sure is. Yeah, yeah but I've been home back to uh, Edinburgh with it in twenty one. Oh. If there's oh. a festival there, I think there will be by next year, twenty one. Um, because in nineteen twenty one, it was the first time Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy met and worked together. They made uh, their very first film together in nineteen twenty one. They didn't meet again for another five years until they became part of the Hal Roach Company. But in nineteen twenty one, uh, I'll, I'll go out there in twenty twenty one and make something of it. That's uh, centenary. So you're you know, doing it. You're definitely I, doing I it. Hope, I hope to be. Yes, I hope to be. Oh. Yeah. Do you keep going through the lines just to just to keep it? Once in a while, yeah. It's all in there. It's in my bones now. It's not just in my head. It's in my bones. You know. Yeah. So uh, I've done that. We've done it so many times, but I, I, I will go through it a couple of times. Well, Jeff, you've had a wonderful career, and I know there's a lot more to come. Thank you so much for giving up your time today. If you're watching this, by the way, on the YouTube channel, just go back to the Acting for Others website. You'll see the donate button at the top. Press that. That will take you straight to the Just Giving page. It's very simple, very straightforward, and just give whatever you can to help industry, entertainment industry professionals through a pretty difficult time right now. Thank you. And if you're already on the website, just have a look at them, press donate. Jeffrey Holland, thank you so much.